Hello everyone, in this video lecture, we will cover a valediction forwarding morning by John Dunn. John Dunn. John Dunn was an English poet. As we know, he was a great scholar, soldier and secretary born into a Catholic family, a remnant of the Catholic revival who reluctantly became a cleric in Church of England. He was Dean of St. Paul's Cathedral in London. He is considered the preeminent representative of the metaphysical school of poets. So you know the metaphysical school of the poet and John Donne was uh, uh, the representative or we can say the most recognized writer in this group. His uh, poetical works style uh, includes sonnets, love poems, religious poems, Latin translations, epigrams, elegies, songs and satires. So we uh, tried every uh, kind of poetry here. He is also known for his sermons, born when he was born he was born on 22 january 1572 london england and he died on 31st march uh, 60, 1631 and uh, his age was 59 at that point of time a valediction forwarding morning about this poem a valediction forwarding morning is a metaphysical poem by john Dunn and uh, it was written in 1611 or uh, 1612 for his wife Anne. So here is uh, the question, it can be asked that uh, for whom he composed this poem and what was the situation that time before he left on a trip to continental Europe. So where he was going that time, he was going to continental Europe. A valediction is a 36 love poem, 36 lines love poem that was first published in 1633 collection songs and sonnets two years after Dunn's death. So here you will find so many questions can be made uh, through these lines and uh, if you are preparing for any exam TZT, PZT, UGC net uh, you should analyze and this should be your uh, habit uh, while reading that uh, you should go through the uh, you know lines and you should create some questions for you. It will uh, engage more and you will remember the lines and uh, the facts well based on the theme of two lovers about so what was the theme of this poem and this is uh, you know here you will see the word conceit and uh, this is a famous conceit we will see uh, in this poem where he uh, compares himself from uh, compares himself and his wife uh, to a compass all right so this is a famous conceit from this poem based on the theme of two lovers about to part for an extended time the poem is notable for its use of conceit and ingenious analogies to describe the couple's relationship critics have thematically linked it to several of his other works including a valediction of my name in in the wind uh, in the window meditation third from the holy sonnets and valediction of weeping so what is conceit uh, in simple language if you say uh, it is a simile or it is a metaphor all right but it is not a common uh, comparison we can say okay so if it is not common it is uncommon thing we are uh, like we uh, we compare if somebody is beautiful we compare to that person to moon okay uh, but if we compare someone is beautiful and we are comparing uh, her to a tree okay so it will be like he he compares uh, his wife and himself to a compass so this is here it is uncommon so it is conceit and if it is usual it will become simile or metaphor now let's come to the background of the work John Donne was born on 21st January uh, 1572 to John Donne, a wealthy iron monger and uh, one of the wardens of the worshipful company of iron mongers and his wife Elizabeth. Donne was four when his father died, and instead of being prepared to enter a trade, he was trained to uh, train as a gentleman scholar. His family used the money his father had made from iron mongering to hire private tutors who taught him grammar, rhetoric, and mathematics, history, and foreign languages. Uh, from background, we get a lot of questions, so we should know uh, this background. So in every uh, poem, we will discuss the background. Elizabeth soon remarried a wealthy doctor, 
ensuring that the family remained comfortable as a result despite being a son of an iron monger and uh, portraying himself in his early poetry as an outsider don dun refused to accept that he was anything other than a gentleman after a study at uh, hall hart hall oxford and Dunn's private education eventually saw him study at uh, Lincoln's Inn, one of inns of court, where he occupied his time with history, poetry, theology, and human learning and languages. It was at uh, Lincoln's Inn that Dunn first began writing poetry, looking upon it as a life sign or mirror irritation rather than something which defined him. In November 1597, he became Chief Secretary of Thomas Egerton. So these are the timelines in his life as soon after met Egerton's niece and more. After meeting in 1599, the two con conducted a heated love affairs uh, in, in the summer of six, uh, 1600 and let, letters to exchange between two reveals the growings uh, suspicion of the end's father, Sir George Moore, and Dunn's place to pick an over the favor of his uh, patron Egerton. The two secretary, uh, uh, secretly married, and uh, so you can uh, see 1599, then they got married, and when Moore discovered uh, this in 1602, uh, like Moore was the father of N, and he had done. Uh, then sent to fleet prison for violating canon law. After many demands, Egerton also consented to Dunn's dismissal. And uh, here, after Dunn wrote to Egerton, he was released from prison during his trial at the court of audience. The marriage was validated and Dunn absolved of many canon law violation, violations. A valediction was written a heavily pregnant end. So this is also uh, background uh, related to background of the poem. So you can see uh, she was pregnant at uh, that time in 1611 or 1612 as Dunn prepared to travel to continental Europe with Sir Robert Drury. So here is again a question for you, like with whom uh, Dunn was traveling that time and with whom he was going for continental Europe tour. It was later published in 1633 as part of the collection songs and sonnets following his death. Now let's go through the summary of the poem and then we will go through the uh, line by line explanation. This poem was written to his mistress when John Dunn takes a leave for uh, to, to continental Europe for a comparatively a long time. Edge, a master of using extended metaphor, so extended metaphor he uses there and conceit he uses there. He has used a image of compass here as a conceit. In the opening of the line uh, of the poem, the speaker in dramatic situation addresses his beloved not to make their separation time the occasion of mourning and wailing. Okay, somebody if somebody is leaving, we usually wail or we mourn. But the poem poet is saying that we should not mourn and uh, the tearful parting may be disrespectful to their true love here he is saying that if our eyes are full of tears or we are weeping we are mourning uh, here uh, it will be disrespectful to their true love as the virtuous man dies silently and without any complaint they should also take a peaceful leave as their love is also virtuous one so if uh, they are True lovers, they can never be separated. Uh, true love is not uh, not physical, but it is more than uh, physical. We uh, we are always connected to each other. Uh, so it is shown in the po poem that uh, like a virtuous man dies silently and without any complaint. Uh, uh, at the same way, in the same way, a virtuous lover will not wail or mourn when they are parting. The speaker goes on counseling her saying when the earth moves or uh, earthquake happens everything on the earth are shaken and brings a great deal of fear so here for fear the word trepidation you will find there okay trepidation you will find later in the poem but the heavenly bodies <clears throat> heavenly bodies sorry heavenly bodies and the 
my universe remain calm and innocent untouched by the temporary movement of the earth so this is like uh, something is uh, uh, moving in their life but if their heart is pure or unshakable uh, this this will not uh, impact them in the same manner she to you too has to be calm and fearless as the separation is for the time being and their love is above all these earthly things like eyes lips and hands means uh, it is their lo their love is above all earthly things like he he means here uh, body which they are not going to miss at all the speaker shows the fact that though he has to go and their bodies are far from each other their soul are one there will not be a gap but an expansion of the love the speaker gives here an analog analog of gold and the gold can be stressed and expanded by thinning it and their love will also expand and travel all the space between them and unite them in this uh, unite them in soul in the uh, so here you will find like uh, he compared with gold so this is again a question and uh, he talks about talks about thinning uh, thinning it okay and stretching it so such words will help you definitely uh, doing the uh, when you will be attempting mcqs or you will be uh, sitting in your exam and in next extended metaphor here you will see extended metaphor is equal to conceit and conceit is unusual simile okay uh, he compares that uh, souls to the compass uh, so you should know and this question is asked in many exams where her soul is fixed feet in the center of the compass like this okay and his soul is the food that moves around the compass so you will see that this is his soul the poet's soul and this this one is his wife okay and he is moving moving all around like a compass however for the moving feet to the compass go it remains attached and connected to the center of the compass as you can see here uh, like if if this is moving but it is connected here uh, so their soul is soul is connected to the uh, center Though the speaker is going to be physically parted, his soul will always be touched with the with his beloved. So he's talking about his wife. The stronger she will be at the time of separation, the more his work will be fruitful. And uh, he he doesn't want her to uh, to wail or uh, to mourn to weep uh, for the separation. Now uh, he talked about his virtuous love. He gives some examples from like earthquake and he talks about compass so such words should be in your mind he firmly says that he has to end his tour one day from where he has begun means he will certainly come back to see her again the intensity of feeling of separation is overloaded in the poem which was written to his wife and before taking leave for continental europe tour uh, the conceit of compass is outstanding in the poem which is often cited in english literature as one of the best example of extended metaphor and that's why it is important for your exams and that's why it is uh, asked in exams like uh, tzt pgt or ugc net some critic takes it as the best known sustained consent conceit his precision of uh, the wording in his poem is praiseworthy the poet depicts that uh, the fear of separation of the lover and at the same time by the end of the poem he praises the beauty of love and their connected soul so if uh, we will uh, ask a question that uh, connected soul is compared to compass okay and such other words so here we will go through the themes as well thematically a valediction uh, valediction this poem is a love poem and Meglota Brown a professor of University of Arizona noted that the entire poem but particularly the compass analogy is the final three in the final three stanza ascribed to love and capacity to admit changing circumstances without itself changing at the same time uh, so a valediction as an example of both the fear of death 
that hounds dance love poetry and the celebration of uh, sex as something sacred the opening draws an analogy between the lovers parting and death while later on poem uh, frames sex in religious overtones nothing uh, noting uh, that if the lover were to tell the lady or uh, lady of love they would profane it okay they would um, uh, degrade it okay so profane here the word tells that degrade it now let's come to the analysis of the poem forbidding knowledge so here is your uh, stranger one a virtuous men pass mildly away like you can see they pass mildly away they don't uh, shout they don't cry okay uh, and whisper to their souls to go means they silently walk away uh, from this earth while it's to some of their sad friends do say the breath goes now and some says no means some are uh, uh, some are sad uh, for their death in the first stanza you can see of this piece the speaker begins with image of death okay he is uh, uh, comparing something or he is giving some example now uh, he is speaking on the death of a man who is virtuous and uh, like we have gone through the summary uh, he talks about talks to his uh, he is giving this example to his uh, beloved wife that we are also virtuous lovers due to his good nature his death comes peacefully Dunn compares dying in his instance of whispering one's soul away this is nothing traumatic so here whispering one's soul away uh, it can be asked like um, what is the meaning of this or what is the relation so it is related to death uh, there is nothing traumatic about it means we should not fear death whisper is perfect example of uh, on metapia so here you will see figure of speech uh, whisper whisper uh, is related to sound so it is on metapia the word sounds or resembles the noise it represents the dying man is not alone there are sad friends some are saying no some are saying no means they are unhappy uh, around his bed who are unable to decide whether or not to not the man is dead his final moments are so peaceful that there is no sign to tell the onlookers at the end that has come they speak to one another asking if the breath goes now or not now let's come to the second stanza so let us melt and make no, no noise means let's go okay like he is going to continental to uh, continental euro on a tour so here you can see so he's saying so let us melt and make no noise like a virtuous person virtuous uh, men's death no fear no tear floods means we should not weep no sigh tempest uh, move so here tempest tempest means uh, uh, hota hai storm okay storm uh, tempest move means we should not move uh, to a profanation of our joys profanation profanation means degrade here of our joys to tell the lady of our uh, love okay the second stanza might come as something of surprise to reader unused to dunn's complicated use of conceit rather then explaining what the first stanza was all about it adds on additional information the speaker is comparing the peaceful death of a virtuous man to the love he shares with his intended listener when they separate they do so without tear floods and sigh tempests of shallow means they should avoid these things like a virtuous person's death then the speaker sees the way other partner are around one another and knows his relationship better means uh, if there are two people and they are virtuous and uh, they are uh, they are loving each other in a true way so they know the the situation of another person better uh, he and his partner would never uh, be so crass to expose their emotion to laity or common people so laity uh, here the word laity is used for common people it is something means like they are not common people they are virtuous lovers they are above the common people so 
So what common people do if uh, two lovers are separating and they are common people, they will love, uh, they, will, they will weep, they will mourn. But here they are not common people. They are above them. That's why they should not weep. It is something they keep to themselves. Okay, they should not, they should die like a virtuous person and they should pass silently. He states that it would be a profanation or disgrace to their joy to expose it. Or, or they, it will profane their love. It will degrade their love if they will weep or it will weaken their bond. They will make no noise and remain on the high ground above those involved in lesser love, loves. Moving of earth brings harms and fears. So like moving of earth means earthquake. He, he is giving here, um, you know, the example of earthquake and he is saying that brings harms and fears men reckon what it did and meant but trepidation of spears through greater far is innocent like uh, when earthquake happens the small things happens but heavenly body does not move the third stranger introduces another image of natural dis disaster the moving of the earth or an earthquake as you can see here it is something unexpected or unexplained Earthquakes also bring along harms and fears. These lines have been added to emphasize the absurdity of making a big deal over the speaker's departure. The next two lines are a bit more obscure. Uh, these are not clear. Like as, as you can uh, read the lines there above lines, you'll find that you will not get uh, the clear idea, but you can uh, you know talk about other things. They refer to celestial spheres or concentric uh, circles in which the moon stars and planet move like uh, means heavenly bodies and although they are sectioned off they still shake and vibrate in reaction to the other events here the speaker is uh, describing their trepidation or shaking or fear okay so this word you can get here it is greater shaking than that which an earthquake is able to inflict, but it is unseen or innocent. This is another metaphor for how the speaker sees the, this, his relationship. It is not the showy earthquake, but the much more powerful shaking of the celestial spheres. Dull sublunary lovers love. Here. So sublunary, it means uh, of this earth, of this earth you can write down this lovers love whose soul is sense cannot admit absence because it doth move those things which elemented it the speaker returns to describing the lesser love so he is talking about uh, sublunary love here yeah. sublunary love he is talking about and he is saying that it is uh, the lesser love quality of others in the fifth stanza he is describing it is dull and it is sublunary meaning it exists under the moon rather than in the sky means it is not virtuous love those who participate in these relationships are driven by the senses physical uh, relationships or uh, physicality is there okay the soul of the relationship is based on what one's senses can determine Physical presence is one of the utmost uh, importance to these lovers. Here is talking about like uh, lesser love and he is calling it sublunary love. Okay. And he is calling it dull and it is related to senses. It is uh, bodily love or you can say physical presence is important there. But if you truly love someone, uh, it is uh, less important and your, your souls are connected everywhere. They cannot admit absence because it does remove the entire relationship. Like if you are uh, you are in uh, true love, so if somebody is not there, still you love that person. If you uh, you care for that person, and here he says that this is end of relationship for those who are sub uh, in sublunary love or lesser love. Uh, but if uh, you are virtuous lover, it doesn't matter. Everything shallow lovers have with one another is based on touch and sight. 
let's come to the strange of it but we by a love so much refined that ourselves know what it is in assured of the mind careless eyes lips and hand to miss so here he is saying that um, physical physically we will not uh, be in touch but we will remember each other the fifth stanza provides a contrast to the fourth like this is opposite to fourth uh, stanza he returns to his own relationship and speaks to himself and his wife as we they have a refined or it's not sublime in love or well tuned and high bro relationship their love is so beyond the physical world that they physical be have trouble understanding it they know what it is means they both know what it is uh, means his he and uh, his wife the next two lines uh, retreat the fact that the love the speaker and his wife have is spiritual it is spiritual love it is uh, not physical love it is uh, virtuous love it is more uh, mental than it is physical this means they are in a assured of mind and do not care for the eyes lips and hands when they part these are not the elements they will miss about each other because they are they have a spiritual love our two souls therefore which are one though i must go india not yet a breach but an expansion means breach it will not break here yeah, breach means break and uh, or separation you can say but an expansion like gold to airy thinness beat like when we beat gold it it expands okay so he is uh, here again he is comparing his love to gold uh, a virtuous love a uh, spiritual love the sixth stanza begins with fairy a uh, fairly straightforward and recognizable declaration about marriage they might have two uh, two separate souls but now they act as one it is due to his fact that when they part they will not endure a breach but an expansion their love will stretch as gold does when it be it is uh, beaten thin it is the same even when pushed to limits when they are getting separated they are not uh, getting separated uh, but they are expanding it is also important to take note of the fact that dan chose to use gold as representative of his love so it, he uh, here it is important for your uh, examination as well he recognizes the elements of his relationship in his durability and beauty in the seventh stanza he says if they be two they are two so as stiff twin compass are two okay so this is most important part of the poem as stiff twin compasses as to thy soul the fixed foot make no so to make to move but does if the other do so here he is giving again let me draw it to make it clear like he uh he compares this foot to his wife and to this foot to himself okay and they are connected uh because of their soul when he moves still they are connected they are unshakable and their love is virtuous love and this is a conceit used in this poem and conceit is extended metaphor you can say or simile it is at this point in the piece of uh, that the image of compass as discussed in the introduction becomes important first dun goes back to his pre uh, on his previous statement about their oneness and he called themselves we okay and he knows that might be some doubt of their inter assured relationship so he makes his this concession if they meaning himself or his wife are two then they are two legged of compass dun speaks of his wife as being the fixed foot 
of the device. She is has the steady soul and remains. So he is talking about his uh, wife's soul that it must be steady. That remains grounded and never makes a show to move. His wife only moves if the other do, meaning himself. And though it is in the center set, yet when the other far doth roam, it leans and uh, hearkens after it. So here the word is hearkens. Uh, hearken is simply you can take it to hear or listen. Listen, hearkens after it and grows erect as that comes home. Now, like it is, uh, is just you can see that. It is leaning towards the center here, okay. And when he comes home, it will like it will come here. So both will erect together, okay. So this is uh, the explanation part. In the eighth stanza, the movement of the fixed foot is further described. Initially, it is in the center of their world. Everything revolves around it. Then, if the other leg the one compared to them decide to roam far into the distance it leans this is the only movement that his wife makes when uh, he needs her to uh, to see her guns after him and straightens up again or grows erect when he comes home or returns to the fixed point such will thou be to me who must like the other food obliquely run obliquely uh, at a slant angle okay here you can see other foot will have will, like this so there is you can say a uh, angle a uh, slant angle you can call it slant angle so obliquely run thy firmness makes my circle just and makes me and where i begin okay so when it will come back to the place uh, they will erect okay the final four lines describe the metaphor in full just in case any part of uh, uh, of the compass analogy was in doubt the speaker is very much addressing his lines to his wife and he tells her that she will be uh, to him the line that brings him back in she has a firmness that makes the circle just or keep it within a limit area no matter what he does or where he roams she will always get him back to where it began means she the the effect or impact of love will bring him home again if we talk about now the form of the poem uh, some question are asked from the poem so form the nine strangers of the valediction are quite simple compared to many of Dunn's poem which utilize strange so first of all is uh, you should know that there are nine nine stanzas and you will see the rhyme scheme a b a b rhyme scheme and an iambic tetrameter is used here uh, these are nine stanzas in the poem four lines in each stanza we saw and quatrain is a four line stanza borrowed from persian poetry so you should write down this important point a quatrain is taken from the persian poetry the poem follows the ab ab rhyme scheme and the pattern continues throughout the poem as we can see here as we enjoyed the poem uh, we have gone through explanation and we saw this rhyme scheme everywhere and rhyme occurs when the stanza and the third line and again within the second and fourth lines like you can see rhyming words are always say go and now iambic tetrameter is a meter uh, in which there are four ions per line. So what is iambic tetrameter? You can see here uh, Where we uh, four ions per lines we find so it is uh, iambic tetrameter the poem comprises iambic tetrameter such as so let us melt and make no noise If we see here metaphor the example of metaphor we saw done relies primarily on extended metaphor to convey his message or we call it conceit First, he compares his separation from his wife to the separation of man's soul from his body when he dies. In the first stanza, we saw this comparison and the body represents physical love and soul represents spiritual or intellectual love. While Dunn and his wife are apart, they cannot express physical love, thus they are like 
the body of the dead man. However, Dunn says they remain united spiritually or intellectually because their souls are one, like the compass. So Dunn continues he and his wife should let their physical bond melt uh, when they part. He borrows the meta metaphor uh, with others saying they should not cry sentimentally, so tear, flood or indulge in sigh, tempests, uh, the storm, such things we saw there. Such base uh, sentimentality would cheapen their relationship or degrade. He also compares himself and his wife to celestial spares, so such uh, comparisons we saw. And finally, if you will see, Dunn compare his relationship with his wife to that of two legs of drawing compass. So here, this is the most important part. Although the legs are separate components of the compass, they are both part of the same object. The legs operate the unison. So there are so many um, metaphors we saw. Now here, paradox we can see uh, in the sixth stanza. Dunn begin to paradox. Uh, after this class, you can go through all uh, these lines and you can mention uh, in front of, uh, you know, the examples you can write down like paradox in sixth stanza, you will find nothing that his or his wife's soul are one though they be two. So here paradox, they are one and they are two. Therefore, their souls will always be together even though they are apart. Similarly, we find uh, in sixth stanza, here, comparing the expansion of their souls to the expansion of beaten gold. Alliteration, we also find and also use alliteration extensively. Uh, following are the examples. So here you can uh, see in different lines, lines 3rd, line 13, 14, 18, 21, 35 or 36. So whilst some of their sad friends do say, okay, so there is repetition of sound. Uh, sublinary love so here is the repetition of l sound so alliteration you can find okay the complete uh, text you can uh, see here again and if you want to read you can go through that and uh, like i told you in uh, previous poem if you have gone through that uh, don't just uh, read the poem try to you know go through the meaning and uh, take out some words like virtuous men tear flood sigh tempest profanation such words you should um, go through and if you remember these words okay trepidation reckon innocent sublinary love so hopefully you know these all words now after i have uh, Mm, already told you these uh, these things okay what he talks about what is the meaning of eyes lips and hands to miss our two souls therefore which are one though i must go endure at all uh, breach and expansion and gold so all these things now you know and if you know this poem now very well uh, you can uh, you can remember it